Hey, Shannon. Hi, how are you? Doing good. How are you? Thank you. Thank you so much for joining me today. You know, uh, oddly enough, this morning, I saw a little uh, I saw a little bit of a video that you did uh -huh. on the Jazz Discharge Party Hats. Yes, yes. Yeah. <laughs> that one came out last Friday. Yeah, that's I wanted to talk to you a bit about that today, actually. Sure. <laughs> um, but any, I, I wanted to start really, I wanted to sort of chat with you about, um, you know, your development as a musician and guitarist, particularly in the early years, you know, just before and during your time with Frank Zappa. Um, now, in the late late seventies, you were studying at Berkeley in Boston, and you had done a transcription of the Black Page and sent it to Frank Zappa. And and a little while later, he sent you a package with the music for the Black Page and a full score of Moen Herb's Vacation. So I was interested to know what were your initial impressions of the Moen Herb's Vacation score. Well, my uh, first of all, it was a stunner. <laughs> because I was at Berkeley and we have these little mailboxes mm -hmm. and there was a note in the mailbox that a bigger package had arrived and I went and I got it and I just couldn't believe it you know that yeah. Frank had sent me this stuff I mean there's a whole preamble story to it mm -hmm. and I had seen some of his scores whenever I could find them sort of printed a little bit here and there very rare so this was really the first big beautiful score and it was two pieces, I believe. It was uh, Mo and Herb's Vacation, and then it was a piece called Wula. Yeah, Wula. Wula, what, however Not you bad. say. <laughs> and it that turned into something else. I'm, I, I don't quite remember. But um, I remember looking through it, uh, just being completely fascinated. Yeah. You know, and... Uh, I don't know if you've ever seen Frank's calligraphy, but it's quite beautiful. Frank really loved because, you know, he was a an artist before he really got into music. And I think he really loved just the, the way music manuscript looked on paper, mm. you know. And if you ever saw any of his handwritten scores, they're very detailed. There was one point when I was doing a lot of transcriptions where... I was trying to improve my calligraphy and Frank gave me a whole set of rapidograph pens that he used to use. <laughs> and I used them. I, I mean, they've got, I don't have them and they got worn out and broken. And, but uh, I remember looking at these scores, just uh, pretty stunned mm -hmm. and so excited because I was scoring and when the way you learn is you look and you listen yeah. to the way others are doing it. And I'd done a lot of that at Berkeley. But one of the funny things was uh, I found mistakes. There was certain ways that Frank notated certain things like uh, seven on one instead of two uh, beams, he would use three. And also I noticed some other spots where there was just because back then everything was done in hand. You know, so he would do the scores and then he'd give it to the copyists. And there was this one whole section where the clarinet it was out of range, you know, and it was out of range even if it was a transposed score. And I, I noticed that. So I I kind of went through it and I made a couple little notes here and there. And then I wrote to Frank and I mentioned them. And he... uh he asked me to mark them and send them and, you know, but when I had met him in New York, he brought another score. He gave me another score. He gave me the, uh, I'm stealing the room score. 200 motels. Yeah. And he gave me Pedro's dowry wow. and sad Jane. And I still have them. And he also gave me a giant score for uh, sinister footwear. They were gigantic. They were like two feet, you know. <laughs> and uh, I remember I was in his hotel room in New York. I was this young kid. I was 19. And we're looking through the score he gave me. And he signed. He wrote in it for Steve Vai because he could play it. <laughs> and uh, in one of the other scores, he wrote, uh, 
this is an early copy, so there might be some errors. Mm -hmm. So we were looking through it, and I said, um, I pointed out that this septuplet was written with an extra bar, uh, B. Now, uh, composers are very um, rigid with their notation, especially if they're accomplished composers. They want to hear about things they're doing wrong. And he kind of pushed back, you know, and I knew I was right, but I wasn't, I was, okay, you know, uh, you know, the book says da da da, but Frank would have none of it. Right. <laughs> So he was, you know, on the lookout for me to be wrong. And I said, this whole section here, the clarinet is totally out of range. And he looked at it and he was silent. And he goes, yeah, the horn doesn't go down that far. So it was interesting to work through some. It's very rare that you get an opportunity to work through music and the compositional process with Frank. He, di he didn't share much. Yeah. Yeah never talked about it. There was only a couple of occasions where I tried to get into it with him. There was an interview you gave um, um, and you were sat in the airport and he was sketching out some chords and you approached him and yeah. you asked him about these chords, these 10 note densities. Did he, I mean, uh, you know, analysts have looked at his music now over the last few years and discovered that there's this thing called the chord Bible. And um, so he had a whole, catalog of chords that are used in his compositions. Did he ever discuss with you uh, methods of implementation? He would just, he called them densities. And he said, I write them on tour. And when I get back home, I use them for composition. Mm -hmm. So if you listen to Frank's compositional music, you know, th there's a method in there. You know, there's, there's definitely, there's nothing um, willy nilly about what he's doing. He's, creating harmonic tapestries based on his ear. And for a composer to do that, they create their own little formulas for how to use chords, how to stack things, you know. So no, I never really was able to have a discussion. Mm -hmm. the, the, the few times that I was, uh, okay, so he wrote Alien Orifice, and handed it to me on an airplane and i'm looking at it and i'm and i was uh, and, I, and i'm sitting in my seat and i'm looking i'm going to get a new piece of music from frank you know i'm trying to think okay how am i going to play this you know because he wanted me to play the melody and i had a question about uh some articulations and i i go up to his seat and i say what do you you know what about here and here how do you want me to do this and he discussed it and then he took a pencil and he wrote those septuplets the really hard, fast ones, right. right on the plane there. And I said, fuck, you know, <laughs> I got it. I went back. <laughs> the other few times that um, I've had a chance to uh, sort of investigate his compositional psychology was when he was working on the Synclavier. Mm -hmm. Because that was... Um, a whole new world for him. Yeah. Frank was always, he never set boundaries and he was never rigid about boundaries, you know, and uh, he always looked to expand them. Even when he got the, you could just tell by the way he notated music. He, he was always pushing and, and he did that in everything. He did it with his guitar playing. He did it with his, his, um, the, what, what he would do to the guitars, you know, he did it in rehearsals. He did it with his lyrics. He did it with uh, gear. So when he got this in clavier, he would write to the company and tell them, you have to fix this, this, and this. And they'd be, you know, falling over to keep up with Frank by writing software that fixed things that, you know, were, were wrong. But I remember I got a chance to sit and watch him for quite a while as he was composing on the Synclavier. And it's really not, it wasn't very uncommon to the way most people do it. You know, you sit and you listen. and But with the Synclavier, he would slow it down and play things in. Like Night School is a solo that Frank did at a slower speed, you know? 
And uh, yeah, I wish I had more, you know, I wish I could sit I wish I had an opportunity to sit with him and really open up musically, but he kept a very solid wall. Yeah. It was almost like it was a secret. <laughs> yeah. it was the, fir the first time I approached him when he was, uh, we were in an airport, that story I told, you know, I, I was just a stupid kid, you know, and I sat down next to the maestro and I go, Hey, what are you doing? You know, <laughs> what are you thinking about when you do that? And he, at first he was like, you know, go away you know what I mean? <laughs> so, so i you know and i'm like whoops i crossed the line you know i tried to peer into the secrets of the composer but then he softened up and he goes come here <laughs> and then he started explaining certain things and they were relatively conventional but you can take conventional conceptuality but it's the ear that's applying the notes that creates the outcome. Yeah. You mentioned Alien Orifice earlier on. I was going to ask you, when you were given the guitar parts, what were the um, technical considerations and mechanical decisions that you had to make when you were learning these pieces on the guitar? Well, it was based on how he wrote it and um, how much articulation he put into it. Sometimes he didn't use much because, you know, he would just want to hear the notes and uh, and sometimes the articulation was very specific. So that might have a. Uh, but I at that time. I, I was a picker. And I wanted to play the melodies as they were written. So when you reading guitar music, you don't slur unless there's a slur. And Frank didn't write a lot of slurs. You know, so it was all picked stuff. Mm -hmm. And uh, he would not write guitaristically. He would just write melodies, you know, like he'd sit at the piano and he'd figure stuff out, write it down and then give it to you. And you just had to figure out how to navigate the, the fretboard with it. So I would take uh, the pieces of music he would give me and I'd have to work on them. Mm -hmm. I can't, you can't sight read this stuff. I don't know anybody that could sight read it. There was some things. I remember once he brought in, we were preparing for a, a concert that never happened with the with a Polish orchestra, a rock band and orchestra. And it was going to be a big event. I think it was. And um, Frank was preparing the music and he came in once with this huge, huge score for dog breath variations. He had redone it all. And I got it. And... You know, that piece of music is straight eighth notes or 16th notes or eighth notes. There's not a lot of bizarre stuff. So I, I looked at it. We were all in rehearsals and I looked at it. I said, and, and, OK, let's do it. You know, so he would drop off stuff. We would rehearse during the day and then Frank would come in, listen to what we rehearsed, and then he would build stuff, correct stuff, change it and sometimes drop off more music for us to rehearse the next day before he came in. So he came in one day with this giant score and this giant, everybody had these parts that were like, you know, they just kept going, you know? <laughs> and it was the dog breath variations of sorts or it was dog meat or something, you know, he gave it another weird kind of name. Mm -hmm. And I remember looking at it and we had to rehearse it that next day. And we did. And we rehearsed it hard. And I, I was able to quasi sight read it. And Frank came in and he was not in a good mood. And when Frank wasn't in a good mood, it wasn't fun. Mm -hmm. We had 80 songs uh, that we had that we knew. And he would say, play this song. And if he heard one mistake, the, whole, the song was thrown out. And if the same person was making mistakes, constantly they were thrown out you know <laughs> so um he came in and we had worked really hard on this piece of music and he was listening to it and he goes stop that's wrong next and i get you know, I, I got a little pissed off you know because i worked so hard on everybody worked so hard and it sounded good and arthur burrow spoke up he goes uh what's wrong with it you know, that I played, I feel like I played it good. And then I chimed in. I played my part good. 
you know. Mm -hmm. But what we found out later was uh, Frank got dicked around and that concert got canceled. Okay. So he was not in a good mood and he just started axing songs. And then I remember he said, play this. And he played this one, four, five progression. Dun, 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 dun. And he, play, he played the whole thing. And it was just a very, very simple one, you know? And he yeah. goes, play it. And he was waiting for anybody to uh, move from what, exactly what he showed. It was very simple. And uh, we knew it. So everybody just sat there and went bum, 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 bum perfectly. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to think if there was at one time I was in the studio and there was a stack of music and I always loved looking at Frank's calligraphy. Hmm. And uh, I'm looking at this piece of music and it was uh, Uncle Meat. Now that melody to me, was like the voice of God when I was 15, That's you know, it's just the greatest melody. I used to listen to it over and over and over it, it, it you know, that all, all that stuff, all those Frank had such a inspired touching melodic ear when he wanted to go there, you know, stuff like strictly genteel sofa, redunzel. These are profoundly beautiful pieces of music, Inca Rhodes. And, um, and uh, God, I loved playing them. He used to give me all the melodies. It was fantastic. Yeah. But uh, I found this piece of paper and it had the Uncle Meat melody written in pencil. And I, I couldn't believe it. I, I said, I was stunned. I, is this it? Is this it? Like, this is the melody that you actually wrote for Uncle Meat? And he goes, original incarnation. Yeah. And he goes, yeah, how else do you think it's going to get played? <laughs> <laughs> it's fantastic. Uh, you, you were talking earlier about the guitar parts and all that, you know, where you have to pick every note. And there's a lot of intervallic leaps between the notes in those, yeah. those three pieces in particular. Um, it must have taken you a while to sort of figure out on the guitar how to sort of navigate the, these um, melodies, and, and in particular in preparation for playing live. And I mean, how did you prepare for that? Well, at the time I had this technique, my tone was not very good, but I could pick fast. Yeah. You know, I, I kind of picked more over the neck, towards the neck. Right. And I used, I did this kind of thing. You can see it in some videos. Mm -hmm. It allows you to kind of do these intervallic skips relatively smoothly, but it's, it, it, there's no, it, it doesn't have a great tone. Mm -hmm. And I abandoned that technique uh, after I left Frank's and, I don't know if I could do the what I what I wasn't doing at that time with Frank was using this finger to pick notes, mm -hmm. which would have changed everything. I wasn't for hammering the large, for the large intervallic leaps. You mean? Yeah, right. it would have made it much easier. I I just didn't consider it. I didn't use that technique, and also tapping. Um, I didn't. I I, I never tapped melodies because. They they didn't have they weren't slurred, yeah. You know when he wrote them they had to be picked, so it was a challenge because you have to f navigate and figure out it's like a Rubik's cube. I mean something something like the Black Page. It it just required a lot of meditation. You know all that stuff. There are certain techniques I used to try to memorize the melodies. Mm -hmm. uh, because there was so much. And uh, one thing I used to do is kind of like sight, re you know, get something to the point where I could sight read it slowly. And then I'd record it. And then I'd put on headphones and go to sleep and have a timer on the cassette to turn on in the middle of the night and play these melodies over and over in my head while I was sleeping. Because I figured, well, maybe that'll reach my subconscious, you know. I delivered. I, I still can't. I look back at it and I think, how did I do that? You know, it was, I mean, I was this kid, you know, I was 20 on the first tour. And it was rough because with Frank, you wake up at 9 a.m. 
you got to get to the airport, you get on a plane, you arrive in a city. And when you're in Europe, you know, there's, there's, there was, there, there was still customs at every border and money exchange and all that. And, yeah. and then you go directly from the airport to sound check, you sound check up until doors. And during sound check, Frank would just change things around and write new music and we'd record it, it was constant and then you get off stage after sound check and you had 45 minutes before the show and we had about 80 songs that we had and i don't know maybe there's 15 songs in a show or something so frank would write the set list five minutes before we went on the stage and it was different every single night and 60 percent of it was just death defying guitar parts you know <laughs> and then we, we'd finish the show and take a break and do another show a lot of times it was two shows in one night and by the time you get back to the hotel 1 a.m i had to use any spare time i had to keep all the songs fresh under my fingers so i i wasn't sleeping and um i was in a state of Stre I was stressed out because I didn't know what song he was going to call. You know, we might not play uh, approximate for a, a week or something. And, and then I'll see it on the list. And I'll go, uh, you know, <laughs> so I had to keep all these songs fresh. And that was that was the challenge. You know, the whole it was all about you wake up and you just work your ass off and then you go to sleep and you, you know, same thing. And it was great training, but it it really uh, psychologically beat me up. Hmm. It's a lot of work. A lot of yeah. Work. But it was gratifying, too, on many levels, because uh, it was really nice to be able to play those complex melodies. And I played them good. You did. I don't know if I played them great, but I, I played them. Played. I played them good, you know. And. um. Also, having the opportunity to play some of these melodies, I mean, you can listen to any instrumental guitar record that was ever made, and you will never hear Sofa, you know, or Redunzo, or or just some of these profoundly beautiful melodies, you know. He was a composer, and I got to play those and with, with an outstanding band, so it was just excellent. I was going to ask you a little bit about um, uh, the talking guitar. How did that come about? You know, specifically jazz discharge party hats and uh, the dangerous kitchen. You never knew what was going to happen on stage with Frank. And one night, and, and he loved when people would come to him with stories. <laughs> Stevie Spanking was one of those stories <laughs> that Frank took and embellished and exaggerated into Frank world. Um, but another time we got on stage, uh, he told the story about an experience that happened in Albuquerque, New Mexico with these girls that worked at the college. And uh, he told it on stage and the band, some of the guys in the band got upset because Frank, he didn't give a fuck, man. <laughs> you know, he, it's like, He'll call you out. I mean, I, the worst thing you want to say to Frank is, hey, you know what happened to me? I'll tell you, but don't tell anybody. <laughs> and he'd go, uh-huh. And you tell him and he'd write a song about it. <laughs> I told him once something that happened to me. I said, don't tell anybody. You know what happened to me last night? And I told him. And the next day on stage, he told the entire audience the story. <laughs> and I'm like, Frank, you know, <laughs> because my girlfriend heard it. <laughs> and some of the guys, girlfriends heard the jazz, this, uh, they didn't hear it, but the guys got very upset with Frank because he mentioned their names. <laughs> so Frank, the next night, he told the story of the jazz discharge party hats. This is why one of the lines goes, who shall, uh, some of the guys in the band who shall remain nameless because their girlfriends might find out, <laughs> yeah. you know, and he did that whole thing, Sprechstein, you know. So 
after the tour, we're back and we're in the studio and we're listening to stuff. And he had the jazz discharge party hats and he's playing it. And I'm listening to it and I'm saying, you know, I could double that. And he's like, go ahead. You know, so I took it and I did it. And it was and it was another, you know, head throwback moment. And then he wanted me to double the double. So yeah. I did that. Yeah. And what other situation could a musician be in where something like that would be expected of them or even allowed, or, you know, yeah. where there's an opportunity. So that's the kind of fun he liked to have, you know, he would push, he wouldn't push, but he'd give you the opportunity to exercise your potential because he had this uncanny ability to um, recognize your potential more, more than you. Yeah. And he would navigate you to it. One of Frank's brilliances is that he he never expected you to do something you couldn't do. You know what I mean? He wouldn't give you things that you weren't good at. Sure. You know, and this how he painted his tapestries with his musicians as the colors. And um I remember when he found, when he mixed it and released it, the jazz discharge party hats. Uh, you could hear my guitars doing the doubling. And when I think about it now, there's so much more I would have liked to have done, you know, because there was a couple of times where I threw some chords in and I got a great laugh from him out of that. Uh, but I would do it differently now. And I would play all those melodies differently because I have better technique, you know, I have a better tone. Mm -hmm. So um, he subsequently remixed that piece and he mixed the guitars the, the doubling guitar really low. And I was very disappointed about that because I worked hard on it and it's really cool, but I understand, you know, you don't didn't want anything getting in the way of the vocals. Okay. So I'll, I'll give you kind of a, a, a whole rundown. Um, so when I was very young, I lit up probably at about four or five years old when I discovered music like a, a keyboard and how notes work it was very it seemed very obvious very natural i immediately felt like i understood the whole infrastructure of composition i couldn't do it but i was like ah i get it and and within that was the realization that the compositional process the creative part of it is is infinite you're never going to tap it out and that's what i wanted to do because my parents had uh, the music of West Side Story. And I loved it. It just really hit me because it's got historically beautiful melody, lyrics. It's got theater. And, and I'm a ham. I like performing. I like that whole silly, you know, the, the stage performance thing. It had um, drama, you know, love interests, beautiful music and intense music. So... I understood what was going on there and I wanted to be able to do it. I wanted to own, operate and control the uh, compositional process. Uh, I'm just going to take a little aside because it, that just reminded me of a quote that Frank said once, uh, and you won't hear it because he just said it in the kitchen. He said, you have to learn to own and operate the word no. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that great. That's a good one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so anyway, um, so I started studying early on, very early. You know, it, I remember when I got to seventh grade, I had, I was taking this high school music theory class, and I took it all through my high school years, and I learned everything. I even started composing. I composed my first orchestra piece for the high school orchestra. But in that period, you can imagine what it was like to discover Frank's music because. He was doing all these things that I loved, compositional stuff. It was, there was the comedy in it. There was uh, great guitar playing. There was stories. There was t intensity. There was beauty. And there was all of these things that nobody was offering. Mm -hmm. And it was done, uh, you know, in, in, incomparably like Frank, you know. So when I discovered his music, that was it. It was like an, you know, a monolith had appeared. And I just started listening. I, I, I couldn't afford the records. So when I started going to, I mean, I bought some records, but when I got to Berkeley, the music library had his entire catalog. So I just owned it, you know, I, 
So uh, being a fan, I uh, wanted to contact him. And as fate would have it, I'm sure you heard the story, a friend of mine had stolen a Rolodex from a studio in New York City and it had Frank's number. And I called when I was 16 and Gail answered the phone. And uh, to this day, knowing Gail, the way she reacted was so unlike her. You know, I mean, she was I mean, she was nice and sweet. But when uh, fans call her something, you know, because I've been at the house when fans have called and it's not a pretty sight, you know, so she was so nice. She said, well, Frank's not home. Uh, call back in six months. He's on tour. So I waited six months and I called again and he wasn't there again. She said, call back. And eventually when I was 18, I was at Berkeley and I called him from a friend's apartment. And he answered. And luckily, he was in a great mood. And I was just like, I'm I'm just a fan. Uh, and that my in was, I knew that he was a Verace fan. And the Boston Public Library had Verace scores. And you can go in and Xerox them. And these scores, they're hard to find, hard to get. So I said, I have Edgar Verace scores I'd like to send you. And I also have a transcription. Because I started, okay, so I was at Berkeley, big Frank fan, but also all sorts of music. And I loved, because I was listening to Frank, all this high information music side, we would write the craziest things to try to play. And I remember when I discovered a quintuplet, <laughs> you know, I was like, oh, five and one, oh, there's seven and one, yeah, you know. And then... Okay, I want to make sure I get this right. Okay, here's the secret that I I, I don't think I've ever really told. Um, UK came to town. Now, at the time, UK was uh, Alan Holdsworth, Eddie Jobson. Uh, it was the original UK. This was the first time, and they were in Boston. And um, they were at a, a record store signing. And I went, and I met Eddie Jobson. And I was, and he explained to me this one bar of the black page. And he said that it had a half note triplet over it, over the whole bar. Mm -hmm. And then there was like, he, he kind of explained it. And that was probably one of the first times I realized that there's a lot more to the musical world than septuplets and quintuplets, you know? And I just freaked out. And the whole world opened up to me, you know? And I was like, you mean you can... Oh, you 13. <laughs> what? You know, so this was magnificent. And I just started writing all this insane stuff. And then I would listen to Frank's music. Oh, that's what he's doing. Mm -hmm. So I started transcribing some stuff and I transcribed the black page the best I could. Oddly enough, um, about six months ago, the Zappa family sent me the original letter that I wrote to Frank with the cassette. So I got him on the phone. I said, I want to send you a transcription and a tape of my band and the Verace stuff. And he was very nice. He even said, well, it'd probably be best for you to send it to the home. Mm -hmm. And he gave me his home address. I mean, this was, knowing Frank, th this was unheard of. <laughs> you know, the fact that he picked up the phone and had a conversation with me. Right. Yeah. And uh, so I did that. I sent him a, uh, all that stuff. Now I could hear, you know, this stuff that didn't fit in a quintuplet or, you know. So that was fantastic. I loved doing that. And I sent it to him. And the next thing you know, the stuff arrived at Berkeley. And uh, so, you know, that part of the story. But then I had another conversation with him. And uh, he was he was in a good mood again. Uh, and he asked me, he goes, do you play piano? And I said, no, I, I you know, I, I don't, I can only play guitar. And he goes, well, you're going to have to learn how to play some piano if you're going to be a composer. And then he said to me, you need to get this book because it, it, it was it was called Musical Notation uh, by Gardner Reed. And he said, that's how I learned to write music. Mm -hmm. 
Modern Music Notation. That's the name of the book. And uh, I got that book, and that is a Bible. That I mean, it is for for many for decades. It's the most comprehensive book for compositional notation that you could buy. So I me basically memorized that whole book. You know, I I used it as a, a guide in composing for my whole compositional life, you know. Um, but that was a, a little insight into Frank's independence also, because he used to say, if you want a good education, go to the library. Yeah. And that's basically what he did. And this Gardner Reed book was his bible yeah. and i if, if, since then i must have purchased dozens of this these books and sent them to friends and everything and uh, that really opened up my horizon and i learned uh proper calligraphy you know all the how to stack tight chords properly and all sorts of things mm -hmm. Because I didn't want to be ignorant McNuggets, you know. I wanted to do it right. I wanted to be that guy that, you know, was an authority on it. I don't know why it was so fascinating to me. I just loved it. It was my interest. And um, he asked me to, he said, I'd like to audition you for the band. And I told him I was 18 and he said, forget it. <laughs> But uh, I'd like to hire you to transcribe some stuff. So it's been a while since I've put it together chronologically. So then he invited me to New York. It was the premiere of Baby Snakes. And that's what I went. It was funny because uh, I walked to his, the St. Regis. And I go up to his floor, and this is a beautiful, one of the best hotels in New York. And I'm this kid, I'm I'm 19, I've got really long hair, I've got an earring, I've got a leather jacket, I got a tattoo, and I'm like a rock and roll greaser. <laughs> and, I'm, and I'm transcribing all this crazy stuff. And Frank had never met me. And I go up and I knock on his door, and the other door opens, and it's John Smothers, his bodyguard. And I'm scared to death, you know, <laughs> and I'm, I'm, I look, I'm like, he's like, what do you want? I said, I'm here to see Frank. And all of a sudden the door opens up and Frank looks at me and he's giving me this, this look. And he goes, yes. And he's, and I said, hi, I'm Steve Vai. And he gave me the most peculiar look <laughs> I've ever seen on his face. And I've never seen it again. He's just like, you know, like this. And he goes, you're Steve Vai. And I said, yeah. And then and then he snapped out of it and he became Frank again. And he goes, OK, come on in. And then we had a, you know, that's when he gave me the scores and all that stuff. And then he gave me a tape. Of. It was two tapes and it was he, this was when he was planning on doing the uh, shut up and play your guitar stuff. And he wanted all this stuff transcribed. Mm -hmm. And he goes, I'm going to give you these tapes. You take them home, make a copy and then bring these back to me. And if I find that they get out, what did he say? I forgot, it was very funny. Something to the effect of, I'm gonna find you and bop you on the head. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I made copies of the cassette and I, and I started transcribing the stuff with the drum parts. So I started transcribing this stuff and sending it to Frank and he was paying me $10 a page. And it would take me like a day and a half to do one page. <laughs> and uh, okay, yeah. So then I I I left Berkeley because um, that's why people go to Berkeley to get a gig like that. And I couldn't do both because the transcribing was all of a sudden taking all my time. So uh, w one of the things I, I forgot to mention was when I received the Moen Herb score at Berkeley, he also put a note in there that said, make me a cassette of the black page as fast as you can play it. Mm -hmm. So I remember at the time I had, uh, I hadn't only had an acoustic guitar or some, I could, I, I, I played it on an acoustic guitar and I did it at two speeds, the normal speed and then like faster. And it was a bitch. I mean, if you could imagine, but I got it. And the cassette player I use is funny because it was broken. 
and only recorded on one side. And in, you know, in flank, in Frank influenced fashion, I used to tape record everything. And the apartment I was in at the time, the neighbors, they were this wild couple. They'd either be fighting or having sex. <laughs> And whatever one of the two they were doing, they were very loud about it. So I would record them through the wall. <laughs> and I, I didn't have, you know, like, you, you got to understand, it's like, uh, it, I, I was broke. I didn't have any money. So like a cassette, I have to reuse it. <laughs> so I, I made this cassette of the black page. And on one side is me playing it. And on the other side is these people in the other room <laughs> fucking and, and fighting. <laughs> So I sent all that to Frank mm -hmm. along with uh, a tape of my band. No, I'm sorry. The tape of the band went first. And when I spoke to him about it, he said, I think you're a pretty good guitar player. Uh, I listened to your entire tape, even the blank empty space. <laughs> I don't know why he said that. Uh, and that's when he said, I want to try you out for the band. But um, and I told him how old I was. And he said, forget it. And he hired me to transcribe. Uh, and uh, I had sent the tape of the black page because that had that was a second kind of communication. And I didn't hear from him. You know, he's not going to, you know, I always, Frank never really called you. You had to contact him. I didn't hear from him. And I called him. And. He wasn't in a very good mood. And I was confused because he was when, when Frank wasn't in a good mood and he was on the phone with him, it was like this. No. Yes. <laughs> no. <laughs> yes. And you're like, imagine, you know, if you're talking to somebody and imagine, they're yeah. just like cold, dead fish, you know? <laughs> and it was like that at that time. And I, and I, I felt like, what did I do wrong? You know, what, you know, 19 years old. Oh, I understand. And uh, I said, well, I'm thinking about moving out to California. And he, he was and he said, well, don't consider moving out here on my behalf. Wow. You know, and I thought, what is going on here? And I, I and then I, I just I said something that broke the ice a little bit. I said, well, Frank, I I wish you could have gotten a chance to speak to Edgar Varese when you were 18 because you know how I feel right now. And he chuckled and he softened. Hmm. So I wasn't going to depend on him. So I left Berkeley. I cont continued transcribing $10 a page. And the day after my 20th birthday, I just moved to California and I moved right down the street. And I just started going up to the house because I was doing the transcriptions. And as soon as I started doing that, he started giving me music to play immediately. He giving me that's what he gave me. The, the 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 first thing I received was like the theme to the second movement of Sinister Footwear, something yeah. insane, you know, and uh, which was like, yeah, you know, <laughs> so uh, then, you know, tons of stuff started happening. He wanted to try me out for the band. His manager didn't want it because it was expensive and all this stuff. But part of my responsibility at that time, uh, back then, in order to copyright a song, you had to send the lead sheet to Washington. And I was tasked with the responsibility of going through Frank's entire catalog and making sure there was proper lead sheets for each song. And down in his office, there was a huge uh, file cabinet and there was a lot, you know, there was a lot of stuff missing. So I went through everything. And in the process of doing all that transcribing with Frank, besides those lead sheets, there was some pretty hefty projects. And besides all of the um, stuff that I did that ended up in the guitar book and, and more, there was Gregory Peckery. So Frank had given me, because Gregory Peckery was all these pieces. Yeah. Some of it, you know, he would just do, and some of it he would compose, and some of it he would glue together. And he needed like a final score of the whole Gregory Peckery. So I took his scores, I took everything I could, and I kind of created one big piece. Yeah. 
another thing that I had done that was very enjoyable and 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 challenging was the entire Roxy record, every instrument. Yeah. And that was nice. So I remember when I was ta- I was I, I met him right before I moved out to California and I was still transcribing. I met him at the uh he played the Nassau Coliseum. And that's when I had mentioned uh I'm getting ten dollars a page and it takes about a day and a half to do a page. And Frank wasn't cheap or anything like that. He was very he was generous and he was business and he uh, put me on a salary of four hundred dollars a week. Mm-hmm. Man, I thought I was rich. I could. I said, "Are you serious? Four hundred dollars a week? <laughs> I could. I couldn't make that in months." And it was great. So I moved out. That since then, I've never really worried. I've never had any money issues because I I always lived below my means. Mm-hmm. But that was my first real job. And I, I, when I moved out to California, so every it was morning, noon, and night was everything Frank. And if I was up at the house, I was either reviewing transcripts or recording. And then finally, he invited me to the sound check. I mean, the uh, rehearsal uh, and auditioned me. But there's a lot of little auditioning stuff along the way. I remember once, you know, the uh, the melody and. Uh, uh, wild love that was one of my audition pieces over the phone with frank because his um his musical landscape was so vast and he was so into compositional things he would give us just this in, in, incredible stuff to try to play and he would always push you you know he 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 wouldn't push you he inspired you to push yourself. He, because he would always say, "Can you do this?" Yeah. You know what I mean. Yeah. So uh, you wanted to, because Frank got a big kick out of when people would do extraordinary things. And one of the first things that I did that really, uh, I think, was uh, he was impressed by was a piece called. It was originally a guitar solo called Persona Non Grata. Mm-hmm. And he had given it to me, and it was originally a live jam over the 3-4 E. Lydian of He Used to Cut the Grass. And he said, "Transcribe, you know, can you transcribe this? I, one of many. So I did. And we were listening to it, and I said, uh, you know, I can double that on the guitar. Because you, know, you wanted to, you know. And he said, go ahead. You know, so at the time, I didn't know how the recording process worked. I didn't realize that you could punch in. I thought, you know, once you start, you got to get it. So this is a long piece of very complex trying to play like Frank, you know. And I remember this was like one of the first things I recorded with him. And I go get to the studio and he wasn't in a very good mood because he, he had a toothache. This happened a couple of times, I think. And um, I started playing, and as I'm playing it, I'm recording it. I felt like I was doing great, you know? And Frank's sitting there like this, you know? And every now and then he'd go like this, you know? I didn't know. It was like, he was like laughing. And I, I'm thinking to myself, shit, I must be blowing it. <laughs> you know, this this is, I must be just screwing this up, you know? And then the tape stops, and I thought, okay, he's going to kick me out now. And he reaches for the phone and he calls Gail up upstairs and he goes, Gail, come down here. You have to see this. <laughs> so, he, you know, we would always love it when Frank would throw his head back and start laughing. Yeah. So you wanted to rise to the occasion. Well, Frank never set out to teach you something. Do you know what I mean? He would never sit down and go, OK, then you then it goes like this and then you have to learn how to do this. And then, you know, it was nothing like that. The few times that he um, was incredibly uh, helpful to me and with wisdom that I took with me for my whole life, they would get, it was given to me in very short sentences because that's the way Frank was. You know, I'm, I, I'm sure you heard the story. I was sitting with him after the first show I ever did with him. I was sitting the, the next morning having breakfast and I said, so how did I do? 
And he said, well, I think you're a really good guitar player, but your tone sounds like an electric ham sandwich. <laughs> you know, and I said, well, why? It's, I've got the guitar, I've got the Strat, the Marshall. And Frank just said, the tone is in your head. The end. Hmm. And that's enough. You know, I've thought about it and I understand it and I've I've used it. And I remember once I asked him when I first first time I was at the house. Can you give me some advice on being a musician? You know, like, you know, and, I, and I'm expecting, long, you know, a long winded, esoteric kind of answer. you got to do what, what's right for you and, you know, and all this stuff. No, no, no. Frank didn't do any of that. He just said to me, keep your publishing. <laughs> And that was the greatest advice because I said, what's publishing? And he gave me the number to his attorney. I bought an hour of his attorney's time. This was over 40 years ago. And that guy is still my attorney. And he saved, I learned all about public. He saved me millions of dollars through the years, you know? So he was very practical thinking. He was himself everywhere, whether he was on stage or off. So the distinction, when he was off stage, he was creating for records or the stage. And when he was on stage, he was delivering himself. But himself was the same when he was off stage. Now, I can't say that about a lot of uh, musicians, hmm. including myself. You know, something comes over you when you're on stage in front of people. Um but Frank was solid, you know, he was solid. And uh, yeah, you know, he was business. You get there, you stand there, you play, you, every, all eyes were on Frank at all time because you never knew what he was going to do. Yeah. I mean, I hardly saw the audience the entire time I was with him, they, they they were secondary. First and foremost was keep your eye on Frank because you just know, don't know what he's going to do and you better be ready. Mm. <laughs> That's great. Listen, thank you so much for talking to me today, Steve. I, I, I really appreciate it a lot. And um, my pleasure. And I, I will tell you that. Uh, um. I spent a lot of time and a lot of lot of work on all of that transcription stuff I did for Frank. Mm -hmm. And as I've noticed in your videos, you appreciate and understand the depth of some of those notational writings. You're the first. In all the years that I've been doing that and all the years up till now, Nobody gets it. Nobody has asked me about it. It's one of those parts that's uh, just not understood. And for me, it's 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 part of my legacy, is in my mind, because that shit's deep, and it's really cool. It is you guys like you yeah. and me. We love that stuff. We love that weird, complex stuff. And that that's the first I've ever seen of that kind of stuff. And for me, it was like every day was like Christmas. You know, it was just so interesting. And you're the really the first one that I've noticed that has recognized it, has dug into it, has made videos about it. And I want to say thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much, Steve. And if there's anything I can do, uh, you know, I'm 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 happy to help in any way. I really appreciate that. It's very kind of you. And again, thank you so much for, for talking to me today. I really appreciate oh, it. My pleasure. Anytime, brother. Thank you, Steve.